morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for being here and joining us over the internet. Happy to have another day to worship the Lord, learn something from His Word. It's a beautiful day outside. And Lord willing, it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful uh, service this year today. So we hope you're excited to hear about the Word of God and uh, hope you're excited to start off with a song. Brother Ken, you come and lead us with me. All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Number 221. 221 in our hymnal. Right to is all I need. Fifth 
lesson of this Psalm 101 study of Christianity 101. We are looking at verse number 4 this week. A forward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Turn in your Bibles with me to Psalm 101. We'll read the whole psalm as our practice has been during this uh, series. We'll read the whole psalm through and then we will uh, teach through verse number 4. The Bible says in Psalm 101, I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. O when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within mine house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A forward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath an high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within mine house. Uh, he that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. I will early destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this place that we can come and gather together in comfort and be able to Without fear of persecution or anything like that, Lord, we can just sit here and enjoy fellowship and enjoy singing and enjoy all that there is in the service. And Lord, help us now to, uh, to dive into your word and to study it and to apply it to our own hearts and lives. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So verse number four, a forward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. This is an opportunity we're going to take to uh, look at the importance of a word. Every word is in the Bible. The Bible says every word of God is pure. Uh, there, there is each word, each comma, each period, everything is there for a reason. Uh, you don't you change any of it, and it's no longer the word of God. It's, it's what man thinks the word of God should say. Uh, so we are thankful that we have a perfect, inerrant, uh, uncompromising Bible in the King James Bible. And so before we begin to study the statements made in verse 4, we have to understand what the word throw-word means. Now, uh, I, uh, I, for a long time in my life, when I was, you know, as a young Christian, I, I was like, forward, is that just like an old way to say forward? That's, that's kind of the, the concept. We see words that are similar, and we kind of connect, try to connect them to something we know, but there's a danger there because the words are different for a reason. The word forward, as defined in Webster's 1828 dictionary, means perverse, that is, turning aside with aversion or reluctance. Not willing to yield or comply with what is required, unyielding, ungovernable, uh, refractory, and disobedient, peevish as a froward child. The scripture example given in the dictionary was Deuteronomy 32.20, and he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. So that definition of froward, it sounds a lot like things that are going on today in our country, but uh, they're very, it's, a, it's all about disobedience and being ungovernable and un, unyielding and, and turning aside from that which is right, perverse. It's, that's the definition of, of froward, but because the word froward in our King James Bible is, seems so similar to the word forward, it's easy to mistake the two words. But let's look at what happens to the context of the verse if we do that. If we swap forward out for forward, we get this definition. Ready, prompt, strongly inclined, ardent, eager, earnest, violent, bold and confident, less reserved or modest than is proper. That's what forward means. If you're a forward person, you're a bold person. You're an earnest and eager and ardent and strongly inclined person. And so it's very, very much different than the definition of forward. So it is important to make that distinction. We must take care that we obey 2 Timothy 2.15, where the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, and the Bible never says read the Bible. It says study. Study the Bible. When we think uh, we understand a word but we aren't sure, we, we ought to do some study to be sure we're rightly dividing the word of truth. For, forward and forward are two very different words with very different meanings. And King David here says that a forward heart an unyielding, ungovernable, perverse heart shall depart from him. So that's just just a little tidbit of knowledge there, I guess, for us. We, we got to make sure that you know if we see something, we think we know what it is. 
So then that's a good opportunity to, to test our knowledge. And we're either going to learn something new, which is good, or we're going to figure out that we knew something, which is even better. Because uh, who doesn't like to look something up and say, hey, I knew that. Um, so so it's, it's a good opportunity with that word forward to understand what that means. Make sure you know the difference between that and the word forward. So to the first statement, a forward heart shall depart from me. We've been going through this whole series so far, breaking down all the statements one by one in each verse and seeing what they mean. And so David is saying, a forward heart shall depart from me. We've defined forward as unyielding, turning aside, perverse, etc. It's clearly a negative connotation. David here is declaring that this type of heart is going to depart from him. And so we'll, cut, we'll consider two things. We'll consider the heart and the departing. First, the heart. Let's turn, hold your place in Psalm 101 and turn with me to Genesis chapter number 6. We're going to look at the first and last uses of the word heart in the Bible, and we're going to look at one other in Jeremiah 17. Genesis chapter number 6 and verse number 5. Genesis 6, 5, the Bible says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Not a very good start for the first usage of the word heart. Every, every imagination of the thoughts of the heart were only evil continually. This is, of course, before the flood of Noah's day. Uh, God looked out and he saw everybody's hearts were just wicked, uh, evil, thinking up, thinking up evil things, evil imaginations all the time. So, so not a very good start. A lot of times there's this law of first, first mention in the Bible, and it's not always true, but a lot of times the first time a word is used, that kind of sets the stage for how it's used all throughout the Bible. And uh, <laughs> this warning about how hearts behave is, is pretty good. Because turn to Jeremiah 17. We'll look at our second one. Jeremiah 17. There are many, many I believe several hundred uses of the word uh, heart in the Bible. I did not uh, take the time to study them all out, but uh, there are some that give us a clear indication of, of what our heart is like. Jeremiah 17, 9 is not a very good one. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things. The desperately wicked, who can know it? Deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's how God describes our heart. Um, now, of course, our heart isn't always that way. We can have some control over our hearts if we'll, if we'll live for the Lord, but in all honesty, we, we must admit that there are times that our heart just wants what it wants, whether it's good or bad or right or wrong, and that heart will do what it can to convince us uh, to go ahead and get that thing. We start justifying Actions, we start making excuses, whatever whatever we can do to make our heart get what it wants and not feel bad about it. Uh, Jeremiah 17, 9 gives a good description of that heart. And then let's look at the last usage of the word heart in the Bible. It's Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter number 18 and verse number 7. Revelation 18, 7. The last use of the word heart in the Bible. This is speaking of wicked Babylon. So when it says she, it's talking about the city of Babylon. It says, reward her, uh, sorry, that's verse 6, verse, verse 7, how much she had glorified herself and lived deliciously. <laughs> so much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen. I am no widow. I shall see no sorrow. This, this attitude of I am something special. I am not going to have any hard times in my life. I'm not going to. I'm not going to see any trouble in my life because I am me. Uh, the Bible. The Bible sees that as a negative uh, thing. If we study out this whole passage, uh, the, the the command is being given. Give that. Give that city what what it deserves. Not what it what it thinks it deserves, but give that city what it truly deserves. Um, back up a little bit, it says, uh, verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, speaking of Babylon, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her, even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works, and the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double, how much she hath glorified herself, 
and live deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. This, this passage teaches us that you know, we, may, we may believe something in our heart, we may convince ourselves of something in our heart, but that doesn't mean that it's true. Uh, she, this, this wicked city of Babylon was convinced in her heart that there's no, no sorrow going to come to me. And God says, oh, man, well, you just wait and see. So these hearts can be pretty tricky things. Um, but obviously, the, the heart can be a good thing. Can be a good thing. Find with me. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a guy in chapter 20. Going crazy here. <laughs> losing losing my mind a little bit. I think I stayed up too late with the youth last night. <laughs> Actually, let's just go to Psalm 57. Let's just go to Psalm 57. King Hezekiah. Notes. King Hezekiah prays to God when he is told that he was going to die. Uh, he prays to God, and in, in his prayer to God, he makes the statement to God, which is a pretty bold statement, um, but he makes the statement to God, you know that I've walked before you with a perfect heart. That's a pretty, pretty bold statement, but God doesn't correct him. In fact, God answers his prayer. And, and David himself, King David at times, has talked about how his heart has been right and perfect before the Lord. And, and so we know that our hearts can be right, and our hearts can be beneficial and good. We just have to control. Psalm 57, 7 says, My heart is fixed, O God, my heart is fixed, I will sing and give praise. We, we just have to take our hearts and Pin them down and say, you're going to stay here. You're going to be in the right place. You're going to do the right thing. Uh, when I read all the different descriptions of the heart in the Bible, it just, it just reminds me of a toddler. Uh, it's inclined to mischief. It's inclined to do whatever it feels like doing the moment it feels like doing it. There's not much patience with the heart, just like there's not much patience with a toddler. And, and I've got two of those now, so I'm getting lots of experience with them. Uh, but the heart in the Bible just reminds me of, of one of those small children that you just, you just got to stop them and say, this is where you're going to be. This is what you're going to do. This is what you're going to uh, press for and what you're, how you're going to behave and what you're going to act like. And it's almost, it's almost like our hearts just are like that. We, we just have to hold them down and say, no, you can't go that place. No, you can't think those thoughts. No, you can't desire that thing that's bad for you. You need to stay right here. And you need to stay focused on this. And, and so we need to treat our heart very carefully. Our hearts can be in the right place and they can be beneficial and good, but, but they sure tend toward wickedness. They sure tend towards impatience. So the heart is, is one thing. David says, a froward heart shall depart from me. Now I want to consider the departing. He says, a froward heart shall depart from me. I have no control over your heart. And you have no control over my heart. Uh, the only forward heart that I can make go away is my own. I can do my best to convince somebody to deal with their heart, but only, only the individual can, can do that. Only I can fix my heart, and only you can fix your heart, and only uh, any, anybody that's going to make that decision has to make it for themselves. Because if you, if you make the decision to clean up your act for somebody else, then that's not going to last. But if you decide, I'm going to make sure that my heart's right before God because you want that, uh, that's a decision that will last and be good. So, so David's speaking of his own heart here. And uh, the best way, the best way that I can cause a forward heart to depart from my life is to go to the heart specialist, the heart doctor. We've looked before at the Psalms where, where David asked God to clean, create in him a new heart and to, to clean up his heart and to, to 
purge him and all those things. But let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15, another verse about the heart. Um, that is, uh, I think this verse is often misused by people, but it is a very good verse. Uh, very good verse teaches us something. Sorry, second Samuel. Oh, flip these around again. Yeah, this, this is me uh, after the youth have been apparently just not not getting my mind straight. I have a completely wrong reference there. So I'll just tell the story. How's that? <laughs> We're in storyteller mode today. When when the prophet comes to anoint the next king. We know it's going to be David, but David's got some brothers. David's father lines up all these brothers from, from, you know, maybe who he thinks is the best, the eldest, the strongest, whatever, down to the least, and David's not even in the first lineup. And the prophet goes through, and he's looking at them all, and, and none of them are chosen. He asks, you know, you got any other sons? And David comes. Before he even gets there, though, the prophet is told of God. To not look at their stature, to not look at their physical appearance, and not look at how amazing they may seem as a candidate, but to, to listen to God because God looks on the heart. Now, I said this verse is often misused. A lot of people use that passage to say, well, I can look like whatever I want to look like because God looks at the heart. Well, yes, God looks at the heart, but he care. Uh, how our, our, how our heart is is reflected in how the rest of us looks. You, you can't look like the devil and say that you have the heart of God in you. That just doesn't make any sense. What is on the inside manifests itself on the outside. If you've got a dirty, wicked, terrible heart that's going to show forth whether you try to hide it or not. If you've got a clean or righteous heart, then it's going to show forth. And so while, yes, God looks on the heart... Uh, and not, you know, not the outer appearance. We, we ought to still, you know, strive to have some form of godliness in our appearance. So, so it's often misused in that way. But uh, the reason I, I take you there today is because God looks on the heart. Very simple thought, but it's, but it's a convicting and a little bit scary thought to me sometimes. That God, God sees my heart. He sees my inner desires. He sees what I really, truly want in this life. And he knows my heart. He knows me as well or better than I know myself. And so if I'm going to try to clean up my heart and make, a, make sure that I don't have a froward heart in my life, who's the best person to go to for help with that? It's not the pastor. It's not uh, the Christian friend. It's God. I can't see your heart. I, I, can, I can get an idea. I can make a judgment call based on what I see in your life. But that's just the best guess. God can see it all. He knows the thoughts and intents of the heart of every single person. So you, so you, want, a, you want a forward heart to depart from you like King David wanted, you're going to have to go to God about it. You have to go to God and say, Lord, I, I want to have a heart that's living for you. I want to have a heart that desires you. Help me with that. Help me with that. I think a lot of the struggle that people face sometimes uh, is that they, they want something they, they want to have a clean heart. They want to have a clean life. Maybe they want to uh, get something out of their life, some sin or some struggle. And, and so they, they pray to God to help them get through it. And they, they, they try to do it on their own. And they try to fix it on their own and get better on their own. And they, they do all they can to, to stop doing whatever they're doing. But they don't go to heart God and just say, Lord, I need you to help me fix this. I need you to help me to help me get through this because I can't on my own. We always we, we like to fix things, men especially. We like to fix stuff that's broken. We don't like to ask for directions and we don't like to read the directions. They're from China anyways, they won't make sense. And so we just say, Oh, I'm just gonna do it. And sadly, a lot of times that transfers over to our spiritual life. Men and women both, we see something wrong in our hearts and our lives, the Holy Spirit convicts us, which is good. We decide to do better, which is good. But we can't really do better without the help of God. So we need to go to the heart doctor and say, Lord, I need a checkup. I need you to check me over and make sure there's nothing hiding in the corners of my heart that's going to come out and hurt me and hurt your name and hurt your testimony. We need to make sure that we, that we do that. The second statement in verse 4 is, I will not know a wicked person. 
And this one is this one's tricky. Obviously, we all know wicked people. You say, well, I don't. Well, maybe you are the wicked person in, in your group of friends. I don't know. But, but we all know people or have met people that we would say are wicked. All you have to do is turn on the TV and wickedness is, is all over in front of you. When we make the decision in our lives to not know wicked people, we're not locking ourselves away in a cabin in the woods to avoid everyone as much as some of us would really enjoy that, uh, especially lately. Um, we are we're not, uh, we're simply not allowing ourselves to get to know wicked people closer than we should. Um, we, over and over in God's Word, we find examples of people who lived, uh, whose lives and relationships with God were damaged by their own influences. Amnon defiled his sister because he had a wicked friend. Several kings led the entire nation of Israel to, into wickedness because they themselves were wicked. Uh, ten spies brought back an evil report from, from the promised land. It caused the whole nation to not go in. It caused them even to, to desire to kill those who wanted to obey God. Uh, wickedness is a little bit contagious there. Over and over, the wickedness of others negatively affects the lives of men and women who otherwise would have been just fine, would have served the Lord, would have been okay. But David declares here that he will not know a wicked person. Well, why? Well, there's some, there's some issues that come with surrounding yourselves with people who are what the Bible would call wicked. When you surround yourselves with the wicked, there's a few things that happen. First of all, wickedness seems popular, even desirable. If everybody around you is doing something... That seems like the thing to do. I mean, it's just it's just simple math. If if all of my friends go out and drink and have a good old time, as they say, then of course you're going to think that it's okay. Of course you're going to think that there's nothing wrong with that. If you surround yourself with people who partake in wickedness, or what the Bible calls wickedness, don't go by society standards, because by society standards, nothing is wicked except for Bible preaching. Amen. And so so go from going by the Bible standards. If you surround yourself with wickedness, then your heart is going to be inclined to it because we don't like, it's not natural, we don't have a desire to be the one person who's different than the rest. As much as ever, you know, people sometimes say, I want to be unique, I want to be special, when it comes to the point of everybody else is doing something that you know is wrong and they're pressuring you to do it, Nobody really likes to feel like they're in that situation. We, we like to be kind of part of the group. We don't, we don't really want to stand alone in every single thing. But yet, if you work in this, in this world, you work a secular job, you, you have family that's not saved, your friends are not saved, you're going to be placed in that position often where you're the one who doesn't drink. You're the one who doesn't smoke. You're the one who doesn't jump in on the lottery ticket buying and all the other different things. And you're the one that doesn't cuss and swear. And you're the one that won't go to the bad places and do the bad things. And you're just no fun. Right. You're just no fun. Amen. And, and so there's, so there, you, you surround yourself with those people and it's going to make you think that wickedness is the thing to do. It's the popular thing and, and it's even desirable. When you surround yourselves with the wicked people, uh, righteousness seems unattainable for the same reason. If nobody around you is, is living righteously, it, it just makes it seem like nobody can. <laughs> you, you can't live righteously. If everybody around you and everything you see is people doing things that are against God, then it makes it seem like it must be very hard to do things for God, to live for God. Because all you see are examples of people who are not doing that. So, so that's another... Another issue, uh, many times I speak with people who just don't believe that they can get victory over something. They, they use some sin in their life as this crutch of, I'll never be good enough, so why try? And I'll never be able to quit drinking, I'll never be able to quit, quit the drugs, I'll never be able to quit the porn, I'll never be able to quit this, so, so I'm not going to, you know, I, I'm not going to be faithful to church because I'm just this wicked sinner and I, I could never get victory. <laughs> Well, of course you think that way when all you're surrounded by are people that are just like you, addicted to the same things you are, and indulging in the same things you are. Of course you feel like you can never get victory over that, but you go to church where there's a bunch of God's people and there's a bunch of people who got victory over things that you're trying to get victory over, and that might help a little bit. But if we surround ourselves with people who are in the midst of the same wickedness we're trying to get out of, it's going to make it seem a lot harder to attain righteous living. Uh, 
third thing that happens when you surround yourself with wicked is that you inevitably become more wicked yourself. No matter how hard you try, the Bible talks about Lot, and, and, the, and the Bible refers to Lot as, as righteous. His, his righteous soul, he was vexed with the, with the conversation of the wicked, with, the, with how the wicked lived all around him in Sodom and Gomorrah, even though he wasn't like them to begin with, he was affected by their behavior. He was surrounded by wickedness. I, I grew up in a public school, which some of you say, yeah, everybody did. Some of you say, oh, that's the devil. And, and, and I understand. There's, there's a middle ground somewhere. I grew up in a public school, and it was not... Um, I know Christian schools are just as bad as public schools in some places, but, but it was not Christian in any means. Uh, there, were, there was a lot of wickedness going on in, in public schools. And, and so it, it was a daily struggle, daily struggle, to not involve myself in that wickedness, to not, to not that every single day was an opportunity to compromise. Every single day was an opportunity to, to do damage to the name of Christ. You had to be, if you were going to be a witness and a testimony for Christ in that school, you had to be on guard all the time, governing your own life all the time, to make sure that you didn't slip up and end up just as bad as everybody around you. Uh, everybody that you're trying to witness to, trying to be a shining light to. And so you surround yourself with wickedness, it, it, it's tough. It's tough to not be affected by that. Um, but on the flip side, when you are not surrounded by wicked people, a few benefits come about. Righteousness seems popular. Uh, with the church I'm from in Michigan, with, when I was youth pastor, 90% of the youth group were kids that grew up in church. All their friends were in church. All they knew was church. And so when we would go out to laser tag or bowling or whatever, and they would see people doing things that they don't, they, they just couldn't believe it. Those people are crazy. Why would they ever drink? Why would they ever cuss? Why would they ever do drugs? Why would they ever fight in the parking lot? We had that happen once. Um, they would see things and they, they would just think those people are nuts because all they knew was I, I would say righteous people but you know we, we kind of struggle with that even us church people but they weren't surrounded by the wicked so they, they saw that and they, they and then righteousness seemed to be the thing to do for them and and so when all your friends are clean living God fearing church attending Christians and it doesn't feel so weird to be a clean living God fearing church attending Christian. You don't feel like the odd one out when you can come here and be among other weirdos just like yourself. And uh, I say that, of course, with all kinds of uh, grace and humility, but we, we are, compared to the world, we are weird. They think that we're weird. But guess what? Maybe we are. But it's alright, because they are too. We, I'd rather be weird in the eyes of the world than, than have God look at me and say, eh, no, I don't want any of that. I'd rather be pleasing to God. So, um, second thing, wickedness seems undesirable. The Bible tells us in Hebrews there is pleasure in sin, and that's pretty much all that we can see in that verse, but we who try to live for the Lord, we read the rest of the verse, and it says for a season. That pleasure in sin does not last. That pleasure in sin goes away, and we see the long run of Paul, we see the big picture, we see that that pleasure that may come from sin, that temporary pleasure, is not worth all the pain, and not worth the suffering that also comes with it. You inevitably become more righteous. When you're surrounded by the righteous instead of the wicked, uh, you consider the simple fact. You know, people say you are what you eat. <laughs> well, you are who you idolize. You are who you read. You are who you watch. You are who you associate yourself with, etc., etc., etc. The the fewer, if there are fewer and fewer wicked influences in your life, your effort to live a more righteous life is less, less hindered. If all the people that you idolize and look up to and watch on the TV and and listen to on the radio and read after in the books and the articles, if all that you're filling yourself with is people that you would consider to be righteous, clean living, God fearing people, that will help you to mold yourself in that way. Of course, the main person to be reading after and following after and idolizing is Lord Jesus Christ. We are Christians, Christ like ones. We ought to be trying to be more like Him. How do we do that? We continually fill our lives and our minds with Him. His word, his preaching, all of that instead of the wickedness. So the question is, what happens when I can't help knowing a wicked person? 
maybe a parent or a coworker or a teacher or, or whatever it may be, you have to be around them on a daily basis sometimes. I have worked in the world. I, I know some I know some very wicked people. I worked in shops uh, many years with my father going we go in as contractors, work in these heat treating shops and, and there were some there were some nice people working there, but there were some pretty rough characters too. And I, I worked in banking a little while. Just, just anywhere you work, uh, you work in this world, you, you live in this world, you have wicked people in your life, sometimes you can't get away from it. So what do you do? Well, first you refuse to join them. Just because you have to be there, just because you have to be around them, doesn't mean you have to partake. It is not rude to, part, to refuse to partake in sin. It's not judgmental to refuse to associate with wicked behavior. God commands us in John 7, 24, judge righteous judgment. So for all who say, the Bible says don't judge, well, actually it doesn't. The Bible says judge righteous judgment. I can't get off on that. We'll be talking about that a long time. In order to judge righteous judgment, wickedness must be refused. We ought to be judging everything to see whether it is of God or not. The Apostle Paul himself said in 1 Corinthians 10, 15, I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. He said, you guys are smart. You judge what I'm saying to make sure that it's of God. We are supposed to make judgments all the time in our lives, or else we're just going to believe everything and follow after everything and fall into every trap. We, ought to, we have to make judgments, but the Bible says to judge righteous judgments judge righteously so we need to look at the situation and look at the fact we have to be around these people but we don't have to join them in their wickedness we don't have to join into what they're doing what they're partaking in how they're living refuse to know them now this doesn't mean just knowing their name but we each choose the people with whom we become close we may have to be around wicked people but we don't have to get close to them personally again this is not bigotry or self-righteousness it's self-preservation People say, you're just self-righteous. It's like, no, I just care about myself. I don't want to be influenced by things that will hurt me in my walk with God. Now, i got to say, though, you you got to be nice. You can't just be like, you know, you're a wicked person. I can't talk to you. That's not how, that's not how we're supposed to do it. But we can't politely refuse to go have drinks after work. And we can politely ask that people not cuss and swear and take our Lord's name in vain around us. And we can be polite about these things and still not be condoning or compromising or, or taking part in the wickedness that goes on around us. <clears throat> Third thing about uh, what do we do when we can't help being around wickedness. First, refuse to join in, refuse to know them, and then refuse to be silenced by them. Refuse to let that wickedness around you that you're forced to be around make you quiet. Often, Christians cower in the face of wicked people because we fear that we will seem judgmental, bigoted, or holier than thou if we stand our ground. That, that's the fear. And, that's, and that's, honestly, that's something that will probably happen. You might get accused of something like that if you stand your ground and if actually step up and say, please don't talk like that around me. Please don't do those things around me. Please don't behave like that around my children or whatever you do. It's, it's amazing how wicked some people are. You, you can't, you walk into a store and some lady's standing there cussing out the cash register person over nothing and just making a big scene and you got your children with you, you got a decision to make. Do I just walk away? Well, first, first decision would be just get them out of there so they can't hear it. But if you're somewhere you have to be and that is happening, you can either ignore it and hope that it doesn't influence the people around you, including your children, or you can try to stop it. Well, if you try to stop it, you know what's going to happen? Probably nine times out of ten now, the person isn't going to say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize your kids were right here. They're going to go into you, start cussing out on you. It's crazy. This world's gone nuts. It used to be just men. Now it's like, no, no offense, ladies, but the ladies are worse. When, when a lady goes nuts, she goes nuts. I mean, it's crazy. And, and, and I, I get it. I'm not trying to be sexist or anything. I'm just saying, from my experience, when I've walked into stores and seen people arguing with people, 
It's not the guys that put fear into my heart, it's the ladies. And, and it's just, it's scary to me that our society has gone so far down this path that, now I, I, <laughs> this, is, this is me, and I'm not saying to do this, but this is something I've done in the past and will continue to do. If I'm by myself and I know that if something, you know, happens and somebody goes off and it's not going to be a big deal because it's just me, um, if I hear a lady cussing and going into it and there's other ladies around, I'll say, ma'am, can you please not do that? There's what there's ladies present. <laughs> and they usually do it. What? <laughs> like they have no idea what I'm saying. It's like there's ladies. It used to be if there was a lady present, you talked nice. You didn't be you weren't cussing and swearing and throwing a fit and doing all these things. And so so if there's some I won't call them ladies, if there's some woman going nuts like that, I say, ma'am, please, there's ladies present. <coughs> and uh, so may not be the right thing to do in that situation, but it sure is entertaining sometimes. I am not perfect either, just in case you didn't know. But, uh, but it's, so yeah, so if you, if you do that, that's very risky. I gotta tell you, it's very risky. We ought to be able to politely refuse wickedness in our lives and relationships, and if someone accuses us of wrongdoing, we need to value God's perspective over man's perceptions. We need to value what God thinks over what man thinks. Um, it's innovative unavoidable for the person who will live for God and strive for holiness that they will someday offend some wicked person. If you're going to live for God and model yourself after Jesus Christ, he offended people. And he told us if we're going to live for him and preach for him, we're going to offend people. It's just how it's going to be because people don't like God. They, there's people that don't like God, they don't like Christ, and if you are portraying God and Christ in your life, they won't like you. That's, the Bible tells us it's going to happen. And so when that happens, if, you're, if you are guilty only of trying to maintain godliness of your life, if you're not being a jerk, if you're not being rude, if you're, if you're just simply trying to maintain some standard of holiness, then, then don't worry about offending people who themselves are an offense to God. I'm not that concerned. I try not to offend people, but it doesn't bother me that much if I offend somebody who is offensive to God. Because... It's just simple math. I mean, it's just what's going to happen. If they hate God and they're offensive to God and God is offensive to them, if I'm trying to live for God, of course there's going to be a clash. Acts 5.29, Peter states, we ought to obey God rather than men. Don't be afraid to stand up. Don't be afraid to politely refuse. We don't need to be mean about it, but we can we don't have to be cowards either. That's partly why wickedness is so rampant in our society because the Christians just kept their mouths shut. Because well I don't want to appear holier than thou and I don't want to appear self-righteous and I don't want to look like don't worry about how they perceive you. Worry about what does God want you to do. Sometimes holding your peace is the best choice, but it's not always the best choice. Society has us so worried about offending others with our standards and beliefs, no one considers what's offensive to God. To make this declaration in our own lives, this, this declaration of, of Psalm 101, verse 4, I will not know a wicked person, forward heart shall depart from me, I will not know a wicked person. Uh, we're going to have to do two things. We're going to have to let God work on our hearts. We're going to have to let God get in there and, and clean them up and scrub them out and, and pray and ask God to, to reveal to us if there's anything wrong with our hearts. Second thing is we're going to have to let go of old relationships that do not, uh, that ought not exist in the life of a Christian, as well as forming new bonds with those who seek to serve the Lord. If you want, if you say, I want to be more righteous, I want to affiliate myself with more righteousness so that I can have a, a better chance of, of becoming more righteous, then, then you might need to make some new friends. You might need to, you might need to spend some less time with some old friends and, and make some new friends who you think are good influences. I feel like I feel like this is a message intended for kids because isn't this what we tell our children? <laughs> have the right friends. Don't have bad influences. But then as adults, we're forced to be around these people. Sometimes on a daily basis, we're forced to be around people that we would never want our children around. So we have to remind ourselves, I can't let that person get too close to me. I can't let myself get too close to them. I need to make sure my friends and my influences are ones that will lead me on to righteousness, 
not pull me back towards wickedness. Because my heart already wants to go that way. We don't need extra influence trying to drag us along. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, I pray that you please help us to desire to not have this forward attitude about our hearts. And Lord, help us to desire to uh, allow you to do what you will with our hearts, to clean our hearts up and set our hearts, uh, fix our hearts on you, Lord. And Lord, uh, when it comes to knowing wicked people, Lord, help us to help us to be able to balance well through the help and the guiding of your Holy Spirit, the, the ability to refuse to be influenced by or partake in wickedness with also the compassion to not offend when, when we are able to not offend. Lord, we are trying to reach these people who are wicked with the gospel. So, Lord, it's not, our, it's not our desire to offend them and make them feel as though we look down on them, but it is our desire to remain clean and unaffected by them. So, Lord, help us to, to maintain that balance. Lord, help us to have a desire to do so. The Lord, we'll thank you. We'll love you for it. And the Lord, pray please be with the service to follow. If there be anybody here today who does not know you as a personal Savior, does not know 100%, that they're going to go to heaven when they die. I pray that please help them to be able to get that settled before they leave here this morning. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Dismissed. The only assignment is the same as last week, to work on the memorization of Psalm 101.